Now, but other people, first things first, this morning let us pray for someone you don't know, but who, would go, who has been going to our chapel in Birmingham for years, ever since I started going down there. Mary Casey is her name, a wonderful lady. She died last Sunday. Let us now please pray for her soul. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord. May her soul and all the souls of the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. There is no particular point in the bulletin except one this morning, and that is that today... Uh, the novena, a novena to the Blessed Mother is beginning. Uh, next week we celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. The novena in preparation for this feast begins today. In your own homes, nothing sophisticated, just a passing thought will be quite adequate, quite sufficient to show her where your heart is and to show her how much we love her. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. I know you can read, but I wish to read it so that I can emphasize it. And that is the thought at the type at the top of our bulletin this morning is this. May I read it, please? And I will also like to add to it the thought to remember that is at the bottom of the page. Please pay close attention. They're very threatening words. Unless the eyes of our souls are turned heavenward, we will in time, like animals that have lost reason, We must lift up our heads and we must gaze upon our true and reliable fatherland which awaits us. We must seek out our God. And if we seek him so with heaven, with honesty and determination and commitment, we will find that he returns our earnest look and in his glance we will see peace and hope, and life. And now I would like to read the thought to remember, which is at the bottom of the page. It seems that the true census catholicus has degenerated to non-existence except in words. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Day before yesterday, Friday, I tell you this for your information, not that I am in any way, shape, or form saying anything ugly about anybody, because I'm not. I have no intention to say ugly. It is not my place to say ugly. I'm just merely giving you history. That's all. Day before yesterday, the bishop of our diocese and the former bishop of the diocese of Birmingham and a very fine and excellent monsignor from Florida 
who has been working over the last 29 years in the Vatican, all three of them came to see me. They were very lovely. And I am not going to say anything ugly about them. And I don't want anybody to leave this room going about to say that he said ugly. No, I did not. For three hours, the pressure was on me full force. The one thing perhaps that they did not uh, expect, but after you get to be an old, old man who lived with the dinosaurs once upon a time, and you learn how to avoid dinosaurs, I knew they were going to gang up on me. So, gun for gun, we ganged up on them. For three hours, if it was said once, it was said way over a hundred times for three hours. And that is, you have got to be under lawful authority. You have got to obey lawful authority or you are not Catholic. For three hours. That wasn't easy. And for three hours, every time they said, you have got to be under lawful authority, they got the answer right back, no, we don't. We are under the word of God, which has been tampered with, which has been changed about, and we are not going to do it. We love you, we respect you, we honor you, but we are not going to change. So help us God. In the course of those three hours, dearest people, again, please, I am not saying a word of ugly. Who am I to be ugly? All we heard in three hours, time after repeated time, was something concerning politics. We have to be under. Not one single solitary word. Not one. Not once. I say this with love and honor and respect. Not one word was said about faith. Not one. Not once. For three hours. But the leading religious leaders of our diocese. And when reminded that the leaders of our diocese would be very much for us, we said, well, we can accept that, but what about all the other hot and tots that are all over creation that don't agree with you? What about them? Oh, don't worry about them. 
The dinosaurs, my dear people, the dinosaurs. So, this morning, let us turn our attention to those who preach and teach and write books and write articles and write all kinds of nice and wonderful and beautiful words who to profess and say beautiful words about this or that or the other. It might be well to not note that these good men, I call them good, did not speak about faith. They don't live their faith. So if they don't live their faith, they don't have to be held accountable for what they say. I'm not calling them evil. This is all on tape if it doesn't. Because this tape has a way of playing out on me. Every time I say something that I want to keep. My beloved people, we read a lot of beautiful, beautiful readings and writings. Old and new, beautiful ones. And we read a whole lot of what we're supposed to do, and we hear tell a whole lot of what we're not supposed to do. We read a lot of books, and we like to quote from those books, quotations after quotations after quotations. And people say, oh my goodness, how well read you are, how much you know. How good you must be, how much this reading must be part of your very soul. We preach sermons, and we hear the most beautiful, soul-stirring sermons that come to us from anybody and anybody and everybody and wherever. And we listen to tapes that are filled with magnificence. That's important. That's very, very important. But there's one thing that it may not be there. No matter how good I preach or teach or write or read, or anything else, if I do not live, the word that I preach and teach I hate to say it but the jaws of hell will be waiting for me. We were told this morning to wake up from sleep. Yes, indeed, we must wake up from sleep. We all want to hear. We all like to hear. We all like to think. good. It is not in the thinking. It is not in the living. Um, it is not in the, in, the, in, in the hearing. But if it's not in the living of it, my dear people, go home. The older, as I told one of them, the visiting priest that was here, a wonderful man with a beautiful personality amongst the best. He had been trained by the trainers. He and I were walking arm in arm behind everybody else. And I said to him, Monsignor,
the older we, and he was an old man, I said, the older we get, the closer we get to death. And the closer we get to death, the more accurately do we look upon the things that you've got to do. The man froze in his tracks. It was as if I had hit him with a bolt of electricity. My dear people, who we are, it matters not. The Word of God hits every one of us in the same way. It is how we respond to the grace of God. You tell, the, you tell our Lord every day, you tell God every day, my beloved people, that you want His holy grace. And I believe that you do. I tell him the same thing, not only once a day, but all day long. And please believe that I mean what I say. But I can ask all day long for the grace of God. But if I do not live in perfect and total and complete and absolute accord with that grace of God... Once again, hell will be waiting for me. It would almost, if I may speak as a fool, it would almost be better if we would tell him, we don't want your grace. At least we would stand a chance of being truthful. And that we would stand a better chance of asking for his mercy. We presume on His mercy. We overlook His justice. We're so busy talking about His mercy. We tell Him we want His love. We tell Him that we do indeed love Him. But how genuine is that love that we tell Him that we give Him? We cannot possibly offend someone we love. Then how is it that we offend him so often every day? That should tell us something. If we love God the way we are supposed to love him, the way the grace of God operates His grace in me, in you. Beloved people, let's face the truth. Let's face the obvious. We say we don't debate. We say we don't want to force and talk about logic. But logically speaking, if you're given the grace and you refuse to live by that grace, then you must suffer the consequences of not living by that grace. Is that not logical? Then who on earth are we making a fool of? We, myself, I am making a fool of me. As I stand shaking in front of him for not having fulfilled why I am here. What is my purpose? How often have I told you, my dear people, and mentioned rather, when I use the word told, please don't look like I'm, I told you so. How often have I mentioned to you, what is your purpose for coming into this house? I speak not of anybody else. I speak only of you. I speak only of us, 
And I speak only of these four walls. Do not judge anybody. Don't you dare judge anybody. Look only to yourselves. Let me look only to me. As I stand here telling you how to save your souls. And if I stand here telling you how to save your souls, then it stands to reason that I, I, me, myself, and I must show you how to do it. It's as simple as that. It ill behooves me to tell you one thing and then to live something else. Then if that's the case, I apologize to the poor Pharisee that I tear apart once every year as he goes up to the temple to pray. Because he is not a bad man at all. Because I would be worse than he. My beloved people, it is no longer time for us to monkey shine around with our holy religion. I'm sorry to say that there are in these days and times activities that we have to look over and pray for them. That's all there is to say. I'm not to judge, neither are you. I'm here to tell you how to save your souls. And in the process, I am here how to show you how to save your souls. And that is not an easy task. I've said it before, and I will repeat it just so that I hope he's listening. He said, my yoke is sweet and my burden is light. Yes, he said that. I will agree with him that his yoke is sweet. But I hope to be given the opportunity to ask him something about the weight of it, if I get to see him. During this past week, I will tell you this in closing, beginning with last Sunday, a week ago, after Mass, all the way to the present time almost, one event after another, almost tailgating each other, one event after another, I'm here to tell you this, I'm not going to tell you what they were. I hadn't even told the monks what they were, it's none of their business. It is for me to carry these things locked up. One event after another, in rapid succession, slapped me in the face as hard as they could slap. The devil is active. He has little time left. And he's going to use it to his advantage. How many times have I mentioned to you the dragon is going to appear for his last time? And he's going to swing his tail for the last time. And in the swinging of that tail, he's going to gather all he can for himself. And our blessed Lord, he uses force. He uses all of his wiles in presenting to us his beauty. Remember, I've also said that he was created Lucifer, the most beautiful 
he has not lost that beauty. And when he presents himself to me, and I see him over here with his beauty for here and now, that I can touch, that I can realize, that I can put my hands on, here and now, and I look over here to this beauty that is presented to me for not the here and now. Beloved people, as far as I'm concerned, at this standing right here, in my ignorance and stupidity and everything else that you can think of, as you can call me, what do I ordinarily choose? And our world goes along with me in that our world has destroyed the difference between evil and good. As far as the world is concerned, they have come together and there is no difference. It's the same thing as saying, Lucifer and God are one and the same. Do you believe that? If you do, go home. I make bold to say that to you because I know you all one and one. And I know that this is not in you. That's why I make bold to say it. We are at that moment in life and the history of things where we have to make a decision and we have to live by that decision without faltering. You will be, un you will be un not accepted. You will be unacceptable. You will be rejected. You will be persecuted. You will be ignored. You will be laughed at. You will be called every day with the book. And you will be told, come on, come on, get with it, let's go. Let's have fun. My dear people, yes, these are frightening words. <laughs> you think I'm scaring you? I'm listening to me. May God bless you. This is Advent. And in your homes, you fathers. You fathers, wherever you are. And if you are missing, you mothers, wherever you are. Bring this to your children. Please do. Show them. Show them what it is to live a census catholicus. Do you know... Again, please, I'm not saying an ugly. There were, as it didn't exactly come out as such, but do you know that those wonderful men did not really comprehend what is meant by the census catholicus? It wasn't all their fault. The old one did. It's not their fault because there has not been anybody in their lives to have showed it to them. They can't be held accountable for that. Therefore, I ask you, precious people, pray for those who do not know. Pray for those who do not know that they do not know. That's the ultimate catastrophe. God bless you. And as you wait in these few weeks that are left now, only three after this one, for the feast of the coming of our blessed Savior, 
our Redeemer. Don't forget that it has also been said by illustrious ones that Christ did not come down to the world to redeem man. Rather, he came to earth to establish some kind of a solidarity between heaven and earth. At least they do admit of heaven. And that's the same thing as saying, as establishing solidarity between heaven and you finish the rest. I give you my blessing. Stay seated.